Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar, The Benefits of Modernizing Capital Program Processes. Um, before we get started, I'd like to do a quick uh, intro of housekeeping uh, items that I would like to, to present to you. Um, we have, okay, so we, during this presentation, we do welcome your questions. So if you have questions, please leave your question in the uh, chat feature of the, of the app. You'll see it on the right side panel, and we will get to your questions toward the end of our, uh, our presentation. Today's presentation will consist of a, a PowerPoint presentation as well as a panel discussion. So during the panel discussion is where we'll, we will start answering uh, questions that have been entered into the chat. This webinar will also be recorded, so we will send you a copy of the webinar at the, uh, end, of this, at the end of the webinar and a follow-up email. And if you would like to receive a certificate of participation, we will also we'll, we will also email a certificate uh, following the webinar as well. So with that, I will hand it over to Dan Connery, who is our senior director of product marketing for Trimble, and he will get us started with our our presentation with our guests. Thanks, Dan. Awesome. Thank away. you. Thank you so much, Colin. I appreciate it. Yeah. So I am super excited about today's topic. I'm also privileged and honored that we have two outstanding speakers to cover the the items today. So really what you're going to see, the first 20 minutes, as Kellen alluded to, is going to be a presentation both by Giuseppe from Pittsburgh Water and Sewer and uh, John, who's with uh, KFA, who's a long-term uh, consulting partner for uh, eBuilder. And they're going to take you through some of the things they did uh, for Giuseppe in his organization and with John for the organization he's consulted with, what they've done to modernize a lot of the processes and the benefits of, of doing that. Uh, if any of you had an opportunity to watch our new normal uh, in construction webinar series we did back in April and May, one of the constant themes was that owners were caught off guard in relying on paper-based processes when work from home was forced on all of us. So not only is this something that we really believe you need to be focused on, but now what uh, Giuseppe and John are gonna help you do is understand once you make the decision to invest in a PMIS solution, what are the processes you, you should attack first? And then what are the benefits of doing so? I'm also privileged to be joined by my colleague, Evan Hill. Uh, Evan's going to be monitoring the uh, questions. So Evan, if you don't mind, just say hello and and uh, and then I'll let you go. Hi folks, yeah, super excited for today's webinar. There are no stupid questions whatsoever. So if you have a question, feel free to drop it in the little uh, question chat bar on your right side of your screen. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on that throughout the entire webinar. Like I said, there are no stupid questions. So I will be off camera for the majority of the presentation, but if, if some good questions come up, and we expect they will, I will reappear and prompt either John or Giuseppe. So looking forward to today's conversation for sure. Excellent. Thanks, Evan. So well, John and I are going to disappear off camera here for a little bit. We're going to hand it over to uh, Giuseppe to go through his part of the presentation. Uh, once he's done, John will pop on and Giuseppe will disappear, and then we'll all come back at the end to have our discussion. So with that, I want to go ahead and hand it over to, uh, to Giuseppe. One call out uh, for anybody who's a customer online, Pittsburgh uh, Water and Sewer was the winner of Elevate 2019 Innovators in Construction. So I had the opportunity to meet uh, with Giuseppe and the team there. What they're doing is awesome. It's especially great to see a public institution uh, who is so innovative with the use of technology. So it's all yours, Giuseppe. All right. Um, well, thank you, everyone, and thanks for the introduction, um, Dan. Yeah, so as uh, Dan mentioned, I'm with Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, and my role is uh, project senior manager for project controls. And um, when I was asked uh, if there was anything that eVoter has done to help us with, uh, you know, our current processes, I was excited to be part of this webinar. So um with that i had two two things that kind of came into mind that really helped us out <clears throat> and i would be you know was actually happy to share this with you guys and uh, with that i'll just jump in so as a public utility we uh you know if anything needs to get approved or if there's a uh, increase in cost or change orders we need to uh, bring that in front of the board and 
with that, we, we have an item called board resolution process. Now, this is something that has been done outside of eBuilder. And during the years uh, prior to eBuilder, you know, as of right now, let me step back. As of right now, eBuilder has been exponentially growing for, for the last two years. And the current um, board resolution process that was being done, it was very minimal. Uh, there were maybe about eight or so, ten board resolution items that go a month in front of the board. Whereas now we're taking about 18 to 25 board resolutions that need to get approved by the board and having the projects get started. So with that being said, this process was done out of eBuilder. It was simply a Word template that was being done and prepared. And folks just had to fill out the categories within the Word template and send that off to the executive admin to uh, via email that would consolidate all the information. Um, with that, you know, it was not really a good document or standard operating procedure that was documented, but nonetheless, it was a process that was been followed for over the years. Um, this process really took a long time, to probably from start to finish, maybe about 20 plus days or so. And as we've been continuing to ramp up, we've been finding out that they, there's been more errors coming through this process that's uh, not being caught and things being caught at the very, very end versus during the process. Um, in addition to that, there was multiple, you know, just like anything else, there's multiple uh, revisions being made, so it's always hard to determine which version control uh, of the document and which one is currently being used to move forward. In addition to that, there were other areas were within this document that had to get hand signatures, which was kind of surprising in this day of age, but it still had to be done and that was a requirement. So we were able to further look into that and understand why they needed to be done and what signatures needed to be fall in place. The executive admin would then have to consolidate all this information, all these documents, uh, and prepare what's called the binder books for the board. And at that time there were seven board members and you can understand the amount of paper that had to be printed out for each binder per board member, and that took a lot of time. And in some cases, we even had instances where there was an urgent matter that needed to go in front of the board. Um, and so the way she had things uh, numbered and in sequential order had to be renumbered and reshuffled. Uh, so again, that took a lot more time, a lot more printing. Um, if there was errors caught, it had to be reprinted again. Um, so there's many pages that had, you know, printing uh, issues and things like that. So what we've done is we we, took, we came together with the uh, with the staff and we discussed on the solution to this. Uh, okay, the benefits. So what we've done is we sat with the folks. We understand. We try to understand who are the appropriate approvers within this project process. Outline a, a, a draft, a workflow. Put them in the sequential order that needed to be in place. In addition to that, once we got that worked out and tested, we even made sure, even based on the layout of the reviewer, maybe finance only needed to look at the financial piece and not everything else that went along with it. So we were able to customize the page layout whenever this board resolution would enter into their court. We then prepared a uh, standard operating procedure, which now the authority uses across the board and now all board resolutions go through this process, uh, no matter what, if you need to get something to approve by the board. This also kind of covers three things. Um, we were able to finalize the process, but most importantly, we had one version of the document. So if there was multiple edits or revisions that needed to be made, this process would then get kicked back to the initiator, have them edit, and now you're still working with that same original file that's been updated and that's one version of the file. Two, um, it really cut down the time and the effort of having to complete these board resolution processes. Uh, every time that this would come up every month, you know, you really get a lot of pain uh, from the project managers or the users having to submit one because they knew it took a lot of time to get these things approved. But now that it's been done in eBuilder, it's all kind of standard. You know what you need to fill out. It's very easy to follow. And it really cut the time down from maybe 20 or so days to maybe within a week to get these approved. Most importantly, and the, probably the number one thing is we've saved a lot of paper. Uh, can't tell you how much printing that went on. You know, maybe the, the printer would get jammed or the toner ran out. Now everything's done electronically. Um, and we also 
when we were talking about electronic uh, signatures, there was one case where we needed the board member to have that electronic signature. So we even looked into having DocuSign integrated with our eBuilder workflow process, which I'll show you here in the next slide. But that there now completes the whole process of having a signature done electronically. And as of today, the actually at the beginning of the year, uh, we've now transitioned the board members to be on iPads. So again, no more binders, no more printing. Uh, the board re resolution items are now within uh, electronic iPads and they make their uh, approvals that way. Two more things, uh, instant notification. So before it was very hard to understand if that process outside of eBuilder e was complete, if the information was uploaded to the network. Now all the approvers and the initiator gets a no instant notification that that process has been complete. And as of today, I'm happy to say that PWSA has now finally gone 100% electronic, where they are now recording, uh, doing board meetings live and having those recorded. And now we're able to still continue, even during this pandemic here of having to work from home, uh, we're able to still get board resolutions completed from a remote access. So that was one of the biggest things that we were able to accomplish, and it came in at a great time <clears throat> to even test it out as we are working remotely. Um, the next slide here. Okay. This is just a quick overview of what the workflow process looks like. Um, as you can see from the left, that's when the initiator initiates the board resolution. It goes through several approvers and works its way down all the way to the board resolution. Oops. To the uh, board member where then they will go into eBuilder, select the information to put in their signature through DocuSign, and then complete the, the, uh, the process. So in addition, we also created a work, uh, I'm sorry, a, da a dashboard that would then help from project control standpoint monitor where all these board resolutions are, are uh, staged at and, and where, whose court they are in so that we can keep track and monitor this information, uh, making sure that the process is moving smoothly. In addition, one of the other requests that we needed to keep this format. So this is how these uh, board resolutions have uh, been finalized, and it was very adamant that we keep this format going forward. So we were able to mail merge the Word template and utilize the information that we had in eBuilder with all the data fields and still populate the same information, making it look exactly like they were doing it before. In addition, you'll see here the uh, the, the DocuSign signature from the board member and also, we also have the eBuilder approvers within that process as well. Uh, so that kind of that's one of the uh, areas that we made an improvement on. The second one that really shines is during this uh, COVID-19. Um, as of March 13th, we've been out of the office uh, and we haven't been able to go back as of yet. So during that time, we PWSA had to determine what was the plan on having a lot of these projects continue on because most of them, I guess a majority of them had stopped it for the time being. Um, and in addition, understand what the plan was for PwSA, what requirements were needed. And the director of engineering came to us and had this issue where they finally came up with the requirements to have contractors and consultants come back and uh, work on projects, but they needed to provide a project safety plan. And he didn't have all the emails for the contractors and, and the consultants and was kind of struggling on getting that information. In addition, they wanted to know what was the easiest way to get that information back to us, you know, avoiding having to go through emails and having that information be, having that information be put into the uh, project itself. So as the outcome came out, we were able to go into eBuilder download all the users, which is the contractors and consultants that are in eBuilder, and provide that information to the director, and we were able to make uh, or submit a mass email to all the users identifying the instructions that needed to be uh, made and the announcements of having to provide their project safety plan to the uh, to PWSA. And within that, we were able to utilize the action item, which I'll show you here in the next slide, of 
having that information sent out to the correspondents of the uh, contractors and consultants and the instructions of what they needed to do and have that information brought back to us so that the project manager and the safety manager can still review that information within uh, the appropriate time. And that review time, once we submitted the information out to the contractors, that review time probably took about a week or less. So um, folks were very happy, especially the director of engineering was very happy on having that information uh, be brought back to us very quickly in a short period of time so that we can get those projects up and running again. As you see here, this is just a, an example of what we had sent out uh, using the action items within eBuilder and the instructions that we had uh, submitted to the, core, to, the uh, to the user. And what they would insert or provide back to us would be their documentation of their project plan, project safety plan, and have that uploaded. And we knew when that came in, at what time, and who ended up reviewing that information. So with that, those are the two areas that I, I could say that eBuilder has really uh, utilized or modernized our way of of utilizing the processes that are currently in the system and, and having that advantage in, at, the, at our fingertips. Um, so with that said, I'll pass it on to John. Thanks, Giuseppe. So it's, it's always good to hear um, experiences of other um, e-builder users, e-builder uh, enterprise or account users um, that are specifically coming from that organizational perspective. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit from the um, the consultant side of things. Um, so we have a, a scenario as a consultant where we have engagements with multiple clients. Um, so we've got clients across the country um, and we've got um, mo mostly in the public sector, uh, DOTs, uh, transit agencies, uh, where they're looking at capital program uh, implementations as well as operations implementations. So that's the perspective that I'm going to uh, be talking about today. So let me get back uh, to my slide. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is John Kirsch. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. I uh, mentioned I'm a consultant at KFA Incorporated, um, Chicago-based uh, Chicago -based firm. I've been there since 2017. Uh, we do uh, PMIS implementation uh, training, maintenance, and, and customer support. So we, we cover the entire range of services that are offered with the PMIS implementation. So <clears throat> Giuseppe talked about the processes they use that have been implemented, but when, when it comes to the work that we offer and that we do for a lot of our clients, it includes that, that part of uh, discovery, gathering requirements, so you can implement what they are asking you to implement, but you've also got to train them on what you've put together uh, and that includes documenting what you've put together so they have a reference uh, if they get stuck, for example, on what do I do in this step in the process. Uh, and then we do maintenance. Uh, they are always looking to enhance the process and make it better, which is always a good thing. We want them to always be looking at ways something can work better for them. And so we do customer support as well. Uh, phone calls, whether they're in-person uh, walk-up requests or whether they're via email, we, we provide those services as well. So today I'm going to talk to you about what um, some of our modernization um, through PMIS implementation and migration, and mainly through the lens of Illinois Tollway, um, another client, K Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, that's Kentucky's Department of Transportation. Um, and I'm also going to talk about uh, Penn State University. Um, the first two I gave, Illinois Tollway and K Kentucky Transportation Cabinet, um, they are um, the, the capital programs. Um, Penn State University is, is on the operations side. They have an enterprise uh, implementation, but you're gonna see that all of them have some common threads as far as their needs and their requirements when they go to eBuilder or a PMIS uh, in general uh, for implementation, migrating from paper processes into a, a digital environment. So a little bit about these, these programs. I mentioned the two capital programs, just so you can get a, a, an idea of the scope of, the, of these projects. Uh, Bridging Kentucky is Kentucky Transportation Cabinet's uh, capital program, six-year program, $700 million worth. Um, prioritized rehab, repair, and replacement of critical uh, transportation infrastructure around their, their state or their commonwealth. 
And then uh, Illinois Tollway has their Move Illinois capital program. It's their most recent capital program. They always have one going on in a continuous cycle of capital improving projects. Uh, 15 years, $14 billion, uh, planning, design, construction, uh, including interchange, new builds, upgrades, road widenings, and realignments and rebuilds. Um, and that, that specific client, I am with them uh, full time. Um, I'm on site, well, not now, uh, up until March 13th and when we were required, required to work from home, um, I was on site full time. There's a staff of uh, two, uh, three additional folks uh, that staff, um, that provide e-builder support. Again, the, the gamut of training, implementation, maintenance and support uh, that are on site at the tollway. Right now, we're able to do our work remotely. We have been since March 13th. And that is another beautiful thing. That is the beautiful thing about a PMIS. All of this work can be done collaborative, collaboratively and remotely. And we've been able to show that we've effectively been able to do this since Mark, March 13th. And the users that were insistent that they couldn't do any work remotely and be productive and effective, they've been able to see that. So they, they now more than ever see the value of uh, a PMIS due to unfortunate circumstances, that being uh, COVID-19. And so uh, just, uh, I just mentioned quickly, uh, Penn State University, their office of the physical plant, they have procured the services of a PMIS e-builder uh, just to help them in, in all of their processes that they perform on a daily basis. So, in this slide, what I wanted to do was just show you, again, in the context of all of our, our, um, our client engagements, um, you see the two separate columns. We go to a client and we talk to them about what they need. They tell us what they need. So a result of that invariably is the left, the, the processes that you see in uh, the left-hand column. These are the most used, most requested, the top hits, you know, whatever you want to refer to them as, of all of our clients and what they need. All of them need consultant invoicing, uh, daily field reports or daily activity reports, different names for different clients, but it's the same thing. Contractors and inspectors need to, you know, re record their and document their daily activity. So they do it through a daily activity reports and they're able to send it real time from whatever mobile device they may be using or a laptop in the field and it shoots it up to the cloud and it's able to be uh, instantaneously available for whatever is needed for tracking, reporting, monitoring in eBuilder. A request for information, I know, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, with those. Uh, correspondence, user access requests, submittal reviews, all of those, those are the top, top hits. You look at rapid risers. Uh, these are, and I call these rapid risers because at the tollway, these were processes that with the exception of the last one, material placement notification, all of these four, um, all the way starting with authorization to proceed down to contract to pay estimate, those were brand new processes and they were required to be migrated from their current paper state into uh, PMIS because of COVID-19. When we got the warning, the two minute warning, the day before uh, we were gonna be having to work from home, we were told, we need these processes because people aren't going to be able hand, to hand deliver their paper versions of these processes. Uh, so we need this in eBuilder so they have a means to uh, access eBuilder so they can submit these, which are very time sensitive. We want people to be able to get paid. We want if they have change management, such as uh, ATPs, change orders, extra work orders, reallocations, they've got to be able to submit it so the clock can begin and people can start seeing internally and reviewing and appro approving these requests. So these were implemented within the last three months and they're number six, seven, eight, and nine after these first five or six on the list of most used processes. Material placement notification, that didn't come about as a result of COVID, um, but it was uh, implemented last year. We had a group of folks, forward thinking folks that said, we want a process that will tell us when there's gonna be a material placement on one of the tollway corridors so we can make sure we plan ahead to have staff out during the material placement. So that was implemented, they adopted it. It's like numbers, I think number six or seven on the list of most used processes. And um, what happened with that is they said, oh, and once we get this up and running, we want this to spawn a new process 
which would be material testing of the material that was just placed. So it's not, it wasn't driven out of need due to work from home requirements. It's not tied in with any kind of cost uh, integration, um, but it's there to show you that once people understand the value and they understand the power of what a PMIS can do, then they start thinking of all the possibilities. And this is an offshoot of that. This is a result of that. Okay, so the, the bottom line is this. With, with moving from paper uh, to a PMIS um, is really a story of before and after. Giuseppe touched on it. You've been in several webinars. If you've attended previous uh, eBuilders webinars, they talk about the, the before state and the after state. All of that is designed to, to uh, illustrate what um, which I'm trying to illustrate now, and, and hopefully what these stories uh, have uh, gotten you to see that, um, you know, paper, uh, while unfortunate, it, you know, a lot of organizations still do rely on paper-based processes. Um, it really is, uh, allows for data invalidity, is, is, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, lost data, lost paperwork, uh, inefficiencies in terms of moving um, a request from one person to another for review. So you have delays when you're dealing with that. Uh, you move to a PMIS, now you're in a self-contained uh, web-based system. So you always have access. You always have an enforced structured workflow where you have a sequence of events that is fully customizable so that everybody that needs to see a certain process and a certain step will see it. Others that don't need to see it won't see it. Doesn't mean that they don't have access to it, but it won't go to them if it doesn't need to for approval. Um, so we, um, the, the next thing we talk about is um, the, the, the concept of the cycle times. From the time that someone submits something for review and approval uh, to the time that it actually is approved, uh, there is a demonstrable decrease in cycle times from the time uh, something is submitted, for example, a change order extra work order, a request for information. Um, instead of submitting a paper, uh, something via paper or a phone call or even an email, that makes a difference um, from doing it that way as opposed to sending something in a structured workflow in a cloud-based system where it's going to go immediately to a user in a, in a certain step in a workflow and they'll receive an email. So email still is a part of it, but you're in a self-contained PMIS web-based system. So you have multiple avenues of communication. So you're gonna have reduced cycle times from start to finish of any given workflow by using a PMIS. And it cuts down on just, it, it makes a process easier uh, in a lot of ways, um, whether it's data entry, data prep, uh, and even using the data that's been aggregated over days, weeks, months, uh, just the, the systems and the means of reporting and even uh, visualization of data is greatly in increased. Um, and I can personally speak for our utilization of reports in eBuilder at the tollway. Um, we, I don't know the number, but we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of reports uh, that are used by us to do our administrative work for the tollway and by various units at the tollway themselves. And another thing about eBuilder is uh, their data is accessible to third party applications uh, for, uh, for whatever reporting needs uh, they may want to use uh, for, for those other applications. So that, uh, you know, to, to a certain extent, uh, eBuilder does play nicely with other applications. They do share their data. And um, so it just, it's, it's everything you want, everything you need all under one roof. It, it's the before and after state. Um, and, and that's really just, you know, the, the best way that I can describe the, the benefits of, um, of migrating to a PMIS. Um, you, you know, Giuseppe mentioned, you're getting rid of a lot of paper and that definitely is true. But sometimes there is uh, one of the outputs, one of the deliverables is paper. And I just wanted to make a note of that. One of the outputs is paper. Giuseppe talked about the form. They wanted to see some version of a physical form uh, through a mail merge that, you know, whether it be a permit, whether it be a, a notice to proceed, they wanted like a PDF version of that. It could be printed out, but it's it's also there as a PDF stored in eBuilders integrated document management system. So just wanted to make, make a quick note about that. And one final, not final note before I close, let me get the slide to advance here kind of had a sneak preview of it. 
um, was on my next slide. I'm having a little trouble moving it. So if I, there we go. Just reporting and dashboards. Powerful, powerful, powerful. And um, once you get the hang of it in eBuilder, um, it has a lot of value. So what I've shown here is uh, underneath is a report that is created in eBuilder. And on top of it is a dashboard. This is an executive dashboard. So leadership, organizational leadership can look and see uh, visualizations of various reports all in one page, all on one web page. So this is a little sampling of what you can do uh, for at a glance uh, visualization for whoever your stakeholders are, executives, crew, uh, or uh, field crew, uh, PMs, uh, construction managers. Uh, that gives you a little taste of what is possible all in eBuilder. You don't have to leave eBuilder in order to do this. Um, so again, modernization, moving into the uh, PMIS from paper-based. Um, I see, I've realized, I, I've realized benefits and, and honestly, I've seen very few examples of where um, they, I, I don't know life without, um, you know, being in a PMIS, um, where it's very limited. The ex examples that I have had, people are itching or I am itching to get them to migrate into a PMIS. So with that, um, I'll, that that's, that's all I have and I'll just um, hand it off from there. Thank you. Outstanding, thanks, John. And we'll go ahead and have uh, Giuseppe, if you wanna rejoin us on camera, we'll jump into the, uh, I can go ahead and turn your camera on for you. So, all right, oh. There we go. All right, I got everybody back on camera. Good, so uh, we do already have some questions coming in, so that's great. Uh, and I'll encourage you to, those in the audience, to continue asking questions. And uh, uh, Evan will pop in, but I did have a couple that I pulled out that I'd like to ask the, the audience first. So uh, Giuseppe, I'll start with you on the first one. Uh, though, John, I definitely want you to lay her in, is the uh, electronic signatures. So we hear often, or I've heard often that government agencies are the most hesitant to move from physical signatures to digital signatures. And yet you both gave examples where uh, that was successfully done. So any uh, tips and tricks you can share with the audience of how you help the organization through that, uh, through that transition? So I'll start with you, Giuseppe. Yeah, uh, you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, yeah, no, it was, uh be honest with you, once we advised them that we can do this electronically, uh, we had to run by legal to make sure they were comfortable of utilizing, if we were able to utilize eBuilder as that source of signature. And uh, when it came to be with a board member, they that that was where the uh, little bit of the obstacle was. But we said, well, what about DocuSign? I know eBuilder has that integration piece with DocuSign. And they said, yeah, absolutely. If that's something we can get um that ended up working out so a lot of the folks and what's funny too dan is that you know and i think john even touched a little bit on this is that you know, obviously once you get a pmis system it's very new you're trying to get people to get buy-in and stuff like that but once you get it to work and once you get it to see the benefits of what the the pmis system can do now we're getting people coming to us saying hey we want to have a process set up hey we we really like what you did with that board resolution, and we want to do something similar to this other thing that's trying to eliminate paper, eliminate whatever the case is. So it's funny because we just get people coming to our desk trying to come up with the new process, and uh, we're, we're enthusiastic by it. It's just now we're, we need the staff to help support all the uh, demands that we want. But um, I, kind of, I think it just kind of speaks for itself when they see the, the actual outcome. Got it. Yeah, man, uh, where do I start with this one? Um, you, you know, I mentioned that full time at the tollway, uh, the Illinois tollway. That has been a really, really hard nut to crack uh, with electronic signatures. We know it's there. We've let uh, the legal department know. We've let leadership know um, that this functionality is here. And hey, this will help. This will help you, you know, cut down on paper. You don't have to download and print and route 
things to sign or even use another app for an electronic signature. Um, so we're not there yet, um, but we're, I think we're farther along than we've ever been. There, what we've been told initially was that there was another state agency that's responsible for cutting checks that does not allow uh, digital signatures. They require wet signatures. So uh, that's what we were told, but we think there might be some easing up on that. Our approach um, is just, just keep bringing up that conversation whenever somebody hints at something like this, uh, you know, wanting digital signatures or being able to, um, you know, if they said, you know, I wish, you know, it could be done easier or, you know, even uh, talking about reducing papers and entree into that discussion. So we, we just bring it up whenever we can. We're not there yet, but we hope to get there soon. All right, good. And I have one more question, and then I'm going to hand it over to Evan because the question panel is blowing up, uh, which is great. So keep them coming in. But the uh, I'm going to start with you on this one, John, because uh, I I was out visiting with Illinois Tollway back in oh, I was 18, end of 18 or beginning of 2019, and uh, one of the things the chief engineer said that really resonated with me was leveraging a PMIS solution to create transparency with the public. And I was very, even though I'm not a citizen of Illinois, I'm, I live up in New Hampshire, uh, it, it made me feel good that one of the things he kept repeating is that he understands that they need to be good stewards of the taxpayer's money. And they want to create that transparency so the taxpayers can see that they're being good stewards of that money. So I'd love to touch a little bit on, if you could, on, on the transparency that a PMIS solution provides. And, Maybe tuck a second question in there, which is also around auditing. Is there any uh, benefit that you see from an auditing perspective of having that level of, of logging and transparency? Yes. Uh, so to, to touch upon um, the second one first about auditing, that's a big point. And I, and I had so many notes about different things, and that was one of them. Um, it's kind of tucked into my last slide. That auditing piece is big. Um, it, you know, if you want to see who is, who did what on any at any given step in the process, the PMIS uh, has it there for you. Somebody took a step, whether it was they approved something and it turned out it shouldn't have been approved or or, or approved with conditions, or if they even sent something back because it needed to be revised by a previous reviewer. All of it, every single action is recorded uh, in eBuilder and is transparent. So anybody that has access to a workflow, to a process, what have you can access that information. So from a transparency standpoint, yes, um, it provides it in that regard for auditing. So um, it, it, it's a, a great preventative tool in that regard. As far as being proactively communicative uh, and transparent to the public, that's a big part too, because as I mentioned before, uh, in a PMIS, the reporting and dashboarding features are very powerful and valuable to tell the story to, to the stakeholders. Now, there are ways that you can allow the public kind of like that a slightly behind the scenes view to the data in eBuilder, but what how I know that they use it at the toll is they pull their reports, which they then, there's a you know dialogue with communications. They aggregate that data, and that's the thing about PMIS, you generate tons and tons and tons of data points that makes it easy to be more transparent, easy to be more accountable and accurate. So the more accurate you are, more credibility you build, more transparent you are. So that is, you know, as far as transparency goes, that, that would be my main selling point for, for a PMIS as opposed to a bunch of spreadsheets and a doc, you know, and, and I'm not going to disparage any other software system, but yeah, so you, you know what I'm getting at. Yeah, and, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Giuseppe, and you want to add in, but that, that concept of, of consistency is something I hear routinely from our customers of, rather than trying to merge multiple spreadsheets across multiple project managers and the inconsistencies that result from that. In fact, we're writing an article about that right now. So I appreciate you talking about that data consistency that happens automatically in the use of a PMIS. So Giuseppe, anything you want to add for on top of what John mentioned? No, he brought those good points where it does have the, uh, the audit functionality of uh, the show history, which I go to all the time and maybe take some screenshots to show people in an email, just simply that's all you have to do and just say, hey, you already approved it at this stage. So um, that is a nice functionality. Thanks cool. for that. We're going to hand it over to Evan then to, for questions from the audience. 
This is good because we are getting absolutely bombarded with questions. Uh, Giuseppe, I will throw this one over to you and then John, feel free to chip in if you want to. How does document management within eBuilder fit into your organization's enterprise document management strategy? Uh, so it kind of made it easy because there wasn't one before. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, when we did go through this effort, uh, just I'm sure like others, there was a lot of uh, you know network folders and subfolders upon that. And so the way we based it when we developed eBuilder was the, the document structure, and we 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 planned it out from a project lifecycle standpoint. So you would have a, a folder for you know your initiation background information, all the way from a planning to a procurement to a construction, and then finally a uh, you know a, a closeout and final procedures. And then there's some subfolders within that. But we try to follow that lifecycle stand standpoint of folder structure across, I want to say it's, it's being used across maybe 95% of our projects. And then you have these kind of one-off projects where maybe they're slightly unique and you may need to make some tweaks to the document structure that may not apply that that standard. But um, that's generally how we came up with one because there wasn't one to, to begin with. So um, I don't know if that kind of helped answer your question. John, how about yourself? So I'm going to answer just with a couple of things that I noted, and I might have to ask you, have to ask you to ask, repeat the question because it was one word you used in that question that prompted me to take a slightly different approach, but maybe not. Um, so one of the things, one of the concepts that we use is we have um, everything that Giuseppe touched upon. That's what we do. You know, we have folder structure in, in a way of you know initiation through um, planning, uh, construct, planning, design, construction to close out. So we do that same uh, kind of practice, uh, but we also use syncing tools um, in order to, they, they still rely on their network drives. So they have a folder structure that we built that mimics their network drive folder structure. So every night they sync up their uh, their documents that are in eBuilder to their, their network uh, drive, the folder structures in their network drive. So that's that's something that, that the Tollway does specifically. And, um, since Giuseppe touched upon um, how their approach is similar to ours, I won't talk about that. I'll just mention that one, one thing that we use documents for is we have a project that is merely like a, a, uni, a universal or standard forms. Um, it, it holds those documents and it also holds all the documentation we put together for processes, for you know how to's and things like that, for all the various processes how to set up a meeting event, um, how to attach documents, you know, you know, from the most basic all the way to the, the most complex processes. So that's a little we, thing That's we perfect, John. We are continuing to get more questions, so I'm just gonna hit through a couple of these. Uh, Giuseppe, I'll follow up with you on this one. Um, how long did it take once eBuilder was chosen to fully implement? And what were the primary steps from your organization's side in terms of the implementation process? So um, we went, so when initially, because I came on board as a, I was originally a consultant and now I'm a, an employee of PWSA. So during that time of the implementation, we did, eBuilder was supposed to be done in three months, but we knew based on the layout and the staff there, uh, they just couldn't do it within that time frame. So we did what was a what we call a phase approach. And we took all the modules that we know that the staff can understand and quickly grasp. And then say you do that as a phase one approach and then transition to um, a, a phase two uh, where they did the process was a little bit more complex, but they were already familiar with the system and the modules. So with that being said, it probably took us about eight months or so from start to finish of fully integrating and completing the um, the uh, PMIS system. And we didn't, at that time, just in case anybody's looking to do this, we do have an ERP system that's outdated and we didn't integrate with that. We were, kind of, we're still doing a few things manually, but we are looking at a new ERP system, which will then take away that manual process that we have uh, let go for, for that time frame. Giuseppe, did your organization, and this might be a dumb question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, but did you guys use an RFQ or an RFP process to select eBuilder? 
I believe there was an RFQ. That was before I got there. Um, but I believe they did an RF, uh, an RFQ. Okay. Actually, John, an how RFP, an RFP. So there was an RFP John, put out. Your... Sorry, go ahead, Giuseppe. No, that was it. It was just an RFP. Sorry. John, did your organization use an RFQ or, or an RFP? Yeah, they, uh, the state of Illinois, uh, the tollway specifically sent out a, uh, a professional services bulletin. One of the items in the bulletin was an RFP for a PMIS. That, Do you mind elaborating it. on maybe what made your organization choose eBuilder over the competitors or, or anything like that? And that would be that, for, that, for Giuseppe or? That's you, yeah. John. Oh, okay. Um, you know, that predates me. Um, KFA has been doing eBuilder at the tollway since 05, and they've been doing various, uh, they've been doing tollway for various uh, clients, you know, well before I came on board in 2017. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how we chose it, but I know we were using another system uh, before we started using eBuilder. Meridian ProLiance, I don't know. I'm sure some people are familiar with that. But eBuilder is our system of choice. How about you, Giuseppe? Yeah, again, that was before my time, but um, I, this question has come up to me several times. And what I've got is that they had other uh, other folks. And I think what stood out was just the the user friendly of the application and the web base of it. And um, they felt that it was easy to um, expand if we were intending to expand as we are now. Got it. So it, it, this is a little bit of a, uh, a build upon one of the earlier questions, and this talks about uh, document retention policies. So you're, you're, you're collecting and storing documents inside of eBuilder Enterprise, contracts, and talked about uh, contractor invoice requests, et cetera. Uh, do you have a document retention policy? So Giuseppe, for you within your organization, or John, for the organizations you consult with, and how does eBuilder layer into that retention policy? So I'll start with you, John, first. Sure, it, it does vary by uh, by client. Um, I know that the tollway does, um, but we don't really worry about that. Um, the tollway has a document management specialist. They uh, they monitor and they enforce document retention policies, anything regarding docu document management policies. They they deal with it, and they do do. They're in charge of that syncing. Um, between eBuilders folder structure and their network folder structure. So we don't bother with it unless we need to coordinate on, you know, rev folder revisions, folder creation, folder deletions, and things like that. So it is there. Uh, there is a policy. We just don't bother. All we do is we say, bring us your documents. <laughs> we'll hold them for you. And, and it does it. It does it just fine. Got it. Does that be anything bad? Now, the same thing, we do have a, a retention policy, um, and we also have, uh, in our case, because we're a public entity, a, a right to know, and um, yeah. that's also come into effect where um, you have these large projects and uh, large, you know, there's drawings and multiple things, and we just, whereas before they used to download everything on CD drives and um, thumb, thumb drives, and uh, now we're just able to make that folder public and give that link to the, whoever it is, and they're able to access that information right away. So, yeah, and I, just to pick on that a minute, a minute, and loop back to my question about auditing, uh, we did, a, and there's a white paper actually in our resource center on uh, eBuilder.net that talks about the top three secrets of a stress fee, a stress-free audit, and uh, and one of them was the fact that what you just mentioned, Giuseppe, about a right to know is around an audit. So we see a lot of our customers will give the auditing agency, or if it's an internal auditor, the internal auditor, access to the information and just tell them go search it yourself. Uh, so it's eliminated a lot of stress on the project managers being pulled in and being asked, hey, who approved this change order? John, you had mentioned that. You can look right in the process and see exactly who approved it. Uh, you, and so what I learned during that process is there's two parts of the audit. There's the proving you followed your process, but there's also proving you have a process. Uh, and so the audit is making sure you're following your process. And of course, with eBuilder, as you showed, Giuseppe, in your presentation, you have your process laid out. So there is the process. 
then you can open up an instance of the process and show that you followed the process because you have no choice but to follow the process. So anyways, I just wanted to kind of layer that back in there. Uh, John, I'm gonna start with you again on this one, but maybe you can lean back on your consulting days also, Giuseppe, and add some more color to this. But it has to do with, uh, the question has to do about lean techniques and just in time, uh, and some of the some of the lean efficiencies that came out of Japan, specifically back in the 70s and 80s. And so if you could talk a little bit about uh, one way to do this is you just take somebody's paper-based process and you build a workflow in eBuilder and you build forms that look just like the forms and you just make it faster. So that's what I would call a level one easy efficiency game. But John, do you spend time as part of, or does KFA spend time as part of their consulting practices evaluating people's processes and looking to see if there's a better way to do it and then automating the better way? Of course, we do that all the time. We wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't do it. Now, does everybody like it and appreciate it? No, <laughs> but it's part of our job. And so we, we definitely do that. One of the things that I'll say, the, the way that it manifests itself typically is somebody will come to us with a level one proposed solution and, and we're right away, we're, we're, we're trying to pick it apart. We're trying to do it politely by asking all the questions that they hadn't thought of. And one of the example I can give is, is the structured workflows for a given process. You know, I mentioned earlier, you know, if you have, you can structure a workflow in such a way where, say it's a certain dollar amount. So if it's below a certain dollar amount, it goes on one track in a workflow, Like right? Certain people, higher, higher level folks don't need to see it. It doesn't need to be approved by the board of directors, for example. But if it's above a certain amount, then it does need to go to a certain, you know, more people need to see it and it does need board approval. So those are the types of things that we look for, like that'll be an example, a basic example of looking for ways to improve a process, make it more efficient by building logic into it, by saying, if you see something that's input into this data field that meets a certain criteria, don't go this way, you know, take the other way, you know, like a choose your own adventure, take the, take the other way. Um, so that would be a basic example of, of what we would, do to, to try to look for doing more, um, bringing more value to the to the client. How about you, Giuseppe? Yeah, there's two there's two ways where we get that information of making. We're constantly looking at improvements, and um, one of the things that we do is we do a uh, sort of a metric and benchmark analysis, and making sure that all of our processes meet a certain benchmark. And if they fall below that benchmark, then we know we're, we're keep the process is working efficiently. Uh, if we see it starting to creep up, then we start looking into it and dig into it. Is it maybe just something as simple as training, or you know, do we have to modify a few things to maybe notify the consultant? Maybe they're submitting things incorrectly that's causing the delay. Um, the other way is just I, I get this all the time. I mean, it's a daily. There's you know, I work with a bunch of engineers, so they they kind of nitpick a little bit at some of the processes. But they'll tell me, they'll say, hey, why are we doing it this way? If You know, you know, they start asking the question and then there's another way of doing it. Do we look at it doing this way? And I'm like, yeah, why not? Let's uh, let's discuss it and get on with it and uh, see if that makes sense with everybody. And if they're okay with it, we'll, we'll adjust the process if everybody agrees to, the, to that and make it easier for everybody. And that's what I keep telling them. We're not here to make your lives harder. I mean, we just want to make it simpler, still get the information that you guys still need to get to review and, and move things forward. And... Uh, and that's what we're here. Awesome, good. So uh, a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up. Uh, what about administering uh, eBuilder? So talk about building processes, training, your uh, building forms to go through the process, adding users, et cetera. What's, uh, uh, and Seppi, I'll just start with you and roll back up to John. What's, uh, what's that like at PWSA? Yeah, I mean, it, it initially started with uh, one person uh, doing all of that. And at that time, we were only doing, PWSA was only doing about $20 million worth of uh, capital improvement work. And as of right now, we broke records each year. And as of last year, we did over $100 million worth of uh, capital improvement work. With that being said, we've grown and we've identified now our staff is from one to now four. But uh, in addition to that, one of the ways we're able to kind of help mitigate some of the administrative piece to it is develop these workflow processes and help us come up with these dashboards where we can quickly identify these issues and quickly address 
some of the errors or training that we need to be done for some of the users if we need to get in there. But it helps us delegate a lot of the work so we know one person's working on a specific side of the process where others are dealing with forms and commitments. So we're able to split the work up efficiently and help uh, still address the day-to-day -day, you know, issues that come out of our way. John? Yeah, it's um, it's essentially the same thing Giuseppe said. You break it into distinct categories of implementation, documentation of what you've implemented, training, um, and, and, and there's all of that. There's there's all of that on a daily basis. We're we're doing all parts of that every day. Some days you're it's more you know uh, one of those areas will be more than the other, and it'll switch off from day to day on volume in a given category. One thing I'll add to that is one of the efforts that I'm trying to make with uh, folks that are internal clients, not field crews or anything like that, unless they specifically ask for it, is reporting, showing them how to build reports, especially if they've come to me more than once for a support for a report, I'm showing them how to do it, or I'm asking them if they want to learn how to do this. Um, some will say no, um, and that's fine. Um, but others will say, sure, show me how to do this. This is great, you know, and let me take this and show others. So again, it's it's, it's showing the value, the power of eBuilder and showing the value of, you know, what they can do in eBuilder as long as they're willing to learn. Cool. So my, my closing question, and I'll just continue with you, John, then go to Giuseppe is, uh, so I'm going to ask you to take your consulting hat off a little bit and put your Illinois tollway uh, hat on. Uh, what, do you, what do you think life would be like at the tollway if uh, they got rid of eBuilder? Went back to no PMIS. This would sound really, really cynical, but not untrue. It would be painful. It would be inefficient. Um, but the state itself, they've come a long way, but it, it wouldn't be something that people would be terribly upset about. Um, now, if you took the PMIS away from them after letting them have it, oh yeah, they would be upset. But if there would, if there was never any initial migration to it, I don't think people would realize there was a better way and that they were missing it. Right. Yeah. And what the point, and you caught the point of the question is for those who have yet to make the transition, which I'll admit to you, I, every day I scratch my head. And I've been working on PMIS solutions uh, for different companies my entire career. And when I see companies that aren't using one, I just don't understand how they can allow themselves to be that way. Uh, so, what uh, you guys in both instances made the trend your organizations made the transition so i'm trying to tease out so you know you know what the promised land looks like uh and so what would it be like if you got kicked out so you told me people would be upset so how about you giuseppe what, what would life be like at uh, pittsburgh water and sewer it'd be a struggle i mean i i keep saying this to folks and uh you know i'm kind of glad that we made this transition five years ago because as of today we we really haven't missed a beat um, even while we've been out. So, uh, matter of fact, the executive director even said that he was very impressed with how we were able to continue still paying people and still moving the process along even while we're all remotely out of the office. So, it just shows that we don't physically need to be there. We can still work remotely. We still have access to the system. We're still able to pay people. Um, finance put us in a pretty good position uh, over the last couple of years. So, yeah, it'd just be it'd be a struggle to be. We couldn't do what we're doing today, so I'm, I'm very awesome. Happy. Well, thank you, and and so I'll just wrap up with uh, one of the key takeaways out of our new normal in construction webinar series we did, uh, as I mentioned back in April and May. Those are also available to you in our resource center on ebuilder.net. Uh, was that for people that didn't invest in a PMIS solution? And again, it doesn't have to be eBuilder. It's just a PMIS solution. Those that didn't this was a massive disruption to their projects and what we saw consistently with the customers that we interviewed during those six weeks is there was very little disruption uh, so that's one of the biggest reasons i believe personally that we will have another work in work at home situation come up and uh, so now's the time to start evaluating a pmis solution so i do want to thank our speakers uh, john from kfa and Giuseppe from uh, Pittsburgh Water and Sewer for taking time out of their day, both preparing for this meet, this today's session as well as doing today's session. So gentlemen, thank you. Uh, Kellen, I wanna hand it back to you to wrap us up and, uh, and let everybody go. Great, thank you guys. Um, 
to wrap up, I'd just like to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, you will, like I mentioned earlier, you will, will receive a follow-up email with a copy of the, the recording of the webinar, as well as a certificate of, of participation. Um, so we expect to get those tomorrow. And uh, thank you for joining. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.